So I'm Chris Bear, um, one of the uh, first year residents here. I'm on the neuroophthalmology rotation right now, so this seems like a good opportunity to present a, kind of a neuroophthalmology oriented case. So we're going to look at a patient who presented with bilateral vision loss uh, accompanied with a headache. So I saw this patient on call in the emergency room. Um, in brief, she's a 64-year-old woman um, with a history of a headache and bilateral vision loss. She developed a severe headache while overseas. She described this headache as very sudden onset, very high intensity, unlike anything she'd ever had before. She went to the hospital there, very reasonable. Um, she had an MRI that was normal, and the rest of her work up there was normal. She came back to the States, um, but her headache persisted. It wasn't quite as intense as it had been, but it, it was still persistent. And about 10 days later, she noticed a decrease in her vision. She went to the hospital, another hospital here in the state. Um, she had a CTA of her head and neck, which was unremarkable. Um, uh, labs showed a mildly elevated ESR, and so she was discharged on prednisone with plan to follow up with her ophthalmologist to uh, get a temporal artery biopsy due to concern for temporal arteritis. Um, after starting the steroids, her vision actually continued to decline, and so she came to the university hospital, which is where I saw her. Um, she had no GCA symptoms, so no jaw claudication, weight loss, muscle weakness, any of the GCA symptoms. And just interestingly, her blood pressure had been in the 140s to 150s systolic. Um, she said she usually runs in the 90s, so it was a bit of a departure for her. Her past medical history was unremarkable, specifically no history of headaches or migraines, and her ocular history was notable for a retinal tear in her left eye that she'd had fixed a couple years prior. No medications, no allergies, um, no family history, and no use of alcohol, tobacco, or recreational drugs. So on exam, she was hand motion in both eyes. Um, pupils were briskly reactive, there was no APD, her motility was full, her pressure was normal, uh, and the rest of her exam, um, was really fairly unremarkable. We saw laser around a tear in her left eye that looked, uh, looked well sealed, but otherwise very unremarkable. And so thinking about our differential at this point, there are a lot of things that can cause headaches and there are things that can cause vision loss, but the things that combine the two, especially with headaches that are this severe, the list gets a little bit smaller. And things that we need to be thinking about, obviously when someone presents with a big, big, severe headache like this. Intracranial hemorrhage is obviously one of the things that pops right to the top of our list. GCA is certainly something we can think about. RCDS and PRESS are something we're going to talk a little bit more about here in a few minutes. Vasculitis can also cause headache and, and vision loss like this. Much less likely are migraines, especially without any previous history. Clots, again, less likely, um, given no significant other risk factors for that. So this patient needs imaging, and so we were able to get that in the emergency room. And a couple of important things to note. Um, it's not subtle here. You can see her occipital lobes. These areas of uh, pretty large and functional <coughs> both of her occipital lobes are kind of what we're drawn to here. Over on the far uh, right-hand side, we have vessel imaging. This is an MRA of her brain. And um, I don't know if we have a pointer here. Let me see if I can just show you over here. Uh, maybe not. I'll just describe it to you. So we see some kind of subtle narrowing of her PCA arteries um, uh, right here and here uh, in this MRA image. And we also, not shown here, but you also had narrowing of her uh, branches of her MCA as well, uh, bilaterally. And so she was admitted to the hospital um, with a little bit more workup. She initially had an elevated ANA. Uh, this was repeated and was later turned out to be a uh, repeat negative. Her ESR remained mildly elevated at 33. The remainder of her workup was negative, and she even had specific vessel wall MRI, uh, which was read as normal. There was no signs of vasculitis or other inflammatory conditions on that vessel MRI. And so for treatment, her steroids were stopped. Uh, this was not consistent with any kind of GCA diagnosis. She was started on nemotipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, and over the course of a few days had resolution of her headache. And so this is a, a case that uh, certainly has features uh, that are consistent with RCVS and PRESS, maybe a little bit less likely to see as vasculitis, but I thought this was a good opportunity to talk about um, RCVS and PRESS. This is a, these are conditions that um, we don't necessarily talk too much about in our general ophthalmology world, but these patients can present to our clinic, and it's a good opportunity to really um, delve into this a little bit more and just review this, uh, for not only for ourselves for boards, but also for clinical practice as well. So RCVS is reversible cerebrovascular constriction syndrome, and this is one of those um, syndromes that's very, very aptly named. Um, it's an encompassing term that um, encompasses a lot of, uh, kind of a collection of different entities that were previously separate, things as postpartum angiopathy, benign cerebral angiopathy, are now kind of under this umbrella of this RCVS syndrome. The pathophysiology involves transient reversible narrowing of, her cere of cerebral vasculature, and it's unclear what the precipitating event is in these. Some people have speculated that headaches will result in vascular narrowing. Some people say that it's the vascular narrowing that comes first, and so people are not necessarily sure um, but we do see this transient reversible narrowing of the cerebral vasculature.
Uh, women are commonly more affected than men. There's no really significant predilection for age or race in the literature. Um, risk factors for this can include things like pregnancy, um, vasoconstrictive drugs, specifically things like um, cocaine, heroin, uh, marijuana has been implicated. Um, SSRIs are another common implicating factor as well. Um, if you have thrombosis, that can do it. And then migraine is also a, a risk factor as well. It's important to know that these are associated risk factors. Not a lot has been shown to prove causation of these things. <coughs> The clinical presentation, typically folks will present with a sudden onset, very severe headache, unlike anything they've ever had before. Folks who have migraines and other types of headaches note a very clear distinction between this type of headache and um, uh, their typical migraine headaches. Typically these are located occipitally and they can, can be associated with nausea and photophobia. Um, they'll typically have periods of these intense pain uh, followed by areas of relief. Um, and so like in our patient, her headache went down, never went completely away, but got better. And then they'll have exacerbations of this pain going back up to that severe level over the next few days to weeks. Um, it's very rare for patients to have RCVS without a headache. Less than 10% of people in the literature um, have a subacute or, or not a very severe headache. And so that, that's one important diagnostic criteria here. Um, Focal neurologic symptoms can develop. Headache is the predominant symptom and can be the only symptom in about a third to half of patients. But uh, focal neurologic symptoms can occur, and specifically for us, visual symptoms that we need to be looking out for could be things like scotomas, um, hemianopias, and then cortical blindness or severely decreased vision uh, like we saw in our patient here. The diagnosis is made by a few different ways. Number one, we have to have a high clinical suspicion for this based on the clinical history and the presentation of this type of headache and, and symptoms. <clears throat> laboratory testing for this is typically normal. There's really no, usually at laboratory abnormalities, including um, inflammatory and other labs. Imaging is important in this diagnosis. MRI is, is very important to look for areas of um, vascular narrowing. Uh, but it's important to know that in, um, in a lot of cases, up to 30 to 70% of cases actually, their initial MRI will be normal. And we saw that in our patient here. She had an MRI uh, on presentation when it first started that was normal. And then she also had a repeat imaging a few days later when she came here to the, the Utah that was also normal as well. And so um, neurovascular imaging is an important thing as well. So, MRA, uh, CTA is an important use, uh, an important tool that we can use. And the classic description when you do angiography is you'll see this kind of sausage on a string pattern. And this is really nicely highlighted up here in this picture uh, labeled A on the far uh, left. You can see these areas of um, vascular uh, dilation and narrowing, um, kind of looking like sausage on a string at a butcher shop if you've ever, ever been to one of those places. But that, that's kind of the classic description right there. Um, here is a little bit closer up view, and you can see on the, on the left-hand side here uh, these areas of vascular dilation and the vascular narrowing. This is a little bit closer up picture. And then over on the right-hand side, you can see this is a reversible process. You can see the vasculature is returned back to its normal state. Um, this is after a month later. And so the management for RCVS um, really resolves around supportive care. So you stop any inciting agents, stop the vasoconstrictive drugs if they're on anything, um, and then um, work on controlling um, uh, blood pressure uh, if their blood pressure is high. Now, blood pressure could be a little bit tricky in this um, because um, hypertension, if the patients have hypertension, it can induce further uh, vasoconstriction, which obviously we don't want. However, if you drop their blood pressure too low, it can result in hypotension, which can trigger ischemia. So it's kind of a fine balance to walk. Calcium channel blockers are kind of the, the mainstay of, of treatment that we use. Um, there's a lot of evidence for uh, things like nemotipine and verapamil um, as far as reducing the severity of their headaches <coughs> and improving the, the, the um, overall symptoms. They don't necessarily uh, impact the time course of uh, vasoconstriction and getting back to normal vasculature, but uh, symptomatically uh, they can certainly improve uh, the headaches uh, that the patients have. So it's a pretty controversial um, uh, intervention. Um, we don't use them typically, and they're certainly not our first line for this condition, and we stopped those uh, when she came here to our hospital. And then in severe recalcitrant cases where they're having progression and, and significant neurologic symptoms, there's been case reports of actually doing intra-arterial administration of vasodilators, which um, is also a little bit of a risky proposition. Um, you risk, by doing that, um, uh, you know, intra-arterial angiography certainly has its own risks, but directly infusing vasodilators also increases your risk of having a reperfusion injury uh, in these patients. So it's a little bit tricky how to manage that. 
Prognosis of RCVS uh, it tends to be fairly good. Most people have resolution of their headaches and angi angiographic constriction within days to weeks. It is a reversible condition. However, about 15 to 20 percent have residual deficits from strokes, um, and we saw that in our patient here. Most of those deficits are minor, but um, some can have severe uh, deficits, as we saw in our patient here. Flipping to um, a similar condition, um, it has some overlap with what we just talked about, PRESS. So posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome is a syndrome defined by characteristic clinical features and neuroimaging findings. Um, as, in our, as in RCVS, it's more commonly found in women than men, and it can affect any age group. Patients as young as two have been reported, and as old as 90 have been reported uh, throughout the literature. The pathophysiology, we see some similarities with RCVS, um, but there's some specific things to PRESS we need to talk about. First, there's um, impaired augurated autoregulation on hypertension. If you remember back to medical school, you remember that cerebral perfusion is very tightly defined, and as systemic blood pressures rise and fall, the cerebral vasculature will constrict and dilate to maintain equal perfusion to the brain. When you get to extremes of that, you can have um, uh, impaired autoregulation that can lead to blood vessels uh, not behaving in the ways they should. It can lead to um, increased pressure to the brain, which can lead to uh, leakage of blood products and causing of edema in the brain. On the flip side, in other cases of PRESS, we can see actually cerebral ischemia and vasoconstriction, which is actually a similar mechanism that we see in RCVS. Um, and then, this is all highlighted by endothelial dysfunction, allowing um, leaky endothelium and allowing blood products to leak into the cerebral uh, to the uh, brain parenchyma. Risk factors for PRESS. Um, so hypertension is the one we classically talk about. It's important to know not only absolute hypertension, which is an important risk factor, but also relative hypertension. So if someone runs in, like our patient in the low 90s, for example, and her blood pressure suddenly spikes up to the 140s to 160s, relative hypertension um, can disrupt the autoregulation, autoregulatory mechanisms and can cause PRESS. It's also been associated with renal disease, um, pregnancy, specifically folks who have preeclampsia or eclampsia. Immun immunosuppressive medications have been linked to it, and autoimmune conditions, things like rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, are also um, commonly described as risk factors for PRESS. The clinical presentation, again, patients will present with headaches, but the headache in PRESS tends to be a little bit more indolent than the abrupt onset kind of thunderclap headache that you see with RCVS. Um, patients will often present with visual disturbances, and the disturbances can be similar. They can have hemianopia, um, hallucinations, uh, auras, uh, and even cortical blindness, like we saw. Patients will um, often present with seizures and altered uh, mental status or encephalopathy. Um, imaging, the classic finding is posterior white matter edema. Um, and you can see here, this is kind of a, a textbook picture of this edema in the posterior uh, circulation uh, right there. Um, what we'll see is um, you can have involvement of other areas of the brain as well. You can have lesions in the, in the frontal lobes, although it's atypical to see involvement elsewhere in the brain without uh, involvement in the posterior uh, portion of the brain as well. On vessel imaging, um, vessel imaging can show vascular narrowing, similar to what we see um, in RCVS, which can make a little bit of diagnostic confusion there um, uh, if we're not careful. Complications from PRESS, um, so uh, you can have ischemic complications, and you can also have intracranial hemorrhage, and this is showing um, PRESS complicated by uh, hemorrhage uh, surrounding areas of edema right there. Um, hemorrhage can occur in as many as 20% of patients, and is really something that, that um, leads to a lot of morbidity um, in patients who have PRESS. The management of PRESS, number one, is controlling hypertension. And again, just as an RCVS, we have to be cognizant of how we control that hypertension. We don't want to drop them too low, or we risk, um, uh, we risk ischemia. But we can't leave them too high, we risk um, uh, hemorrhage. Treatment of seizures is obviously important. Treatment of eclampsia if they're pregnant is very important. Um, and then again, in this condition, just like an RCVS, steroids are not typically recommended. Steroids can um, negatively impact your blood pressure, making it difficult to predict where it's going to go. And so we typically don't uh, use steroids in these cases as well. The prognosis, most cases of PRESS are benign without lasting deficits, and it's reversible just like RCVS, um, with symptomatic improvement usually occurring before we see radiographic resolution of, of uh, edema and things. Uh, the minority of cases, however, do have lasting neurologic deficits, and recurrence is uncommon. Thankfully, less than 10% of patients do have a recurrence. And so, you know, the, uh, our patient here has features certainly of both. Her, her blood pressure was higher than it, than it was in the past. She had vascular narrowing on exam or on, on imaging, um, and um, certainly areas of, of infarction uh, on imaging as well. And so 
the diagnosis for her is a little bit unclear, but the treatment for her, either way, would, would be the same. And this is an important thing because as ophthalmologists, you know, patients will come in with, with visual deficits. And, um, you know, it's an important thing for us to be, you know, just cognizant of and, and to keep on our differential because, um, you know, these things are, are diagnosed not only by imaging but with clinical suspicion. And, and if we don't have that clinical suspicion, you know, there's one thing that we could potentially miss. So um, this case was a good example to kind of review these, these, um, these conditions and um, just kind of refresh our memory uh, on, on these things. Any questions? Great. Oh, Dr. Ben. So how common are these? I mean, I mean it's, this is really bizarre. A, a, a isolated, relatively brief period of... Uh, of Focal dysautonomia. I mean, that, that's essentially what this is, and and uh, obviously pretty scary as you think about how this all evolves. I mean, Judith, how often do you see one of these cases? You, you see one of these once a year. Well, we don't see uh, the vast majority of the cases in neuroophthalmology because most people don't have any lasting deficits. Uh, but over at the hospital, they've got you know at least a couple of months. And, uh, so I this mean, is what you're saying is, is this this is certainly rare but not uncommon. Right. Yeah. And if you lump RCVS and Press together, which radiologically I think that they think of them as kind of a continuum. They're both a dysautonomia of some sort. Right. Well, and there's a predilection for the posterior circulation because the autoregulation of the posterior circulation is less robust than the anterior circulation. Uh, but interestingly, you can even get a similar syndrome of Press uh, in the brain stem, um, so all kinds of weird eye movement abnormalities and things. It can be a real puzzle um, clinically to figure it out, but with, uh, with all the young pregnant people, with all people on uh, the medications that are known to precipitate press, even over at primary, you'll see, uh, you'll see these uh, conditions. And I mean, I, would, I, I can't really put a number on it, but I would say that at any given time, they probably have somebody in the hospital with it, um, whether it be on the um, OBGYN floor or uh, in the medical ICU. Um, and controlled blood them. pressure, the funding agent, give them time and they, it tends to resolve and not come back? Yeah, most of the time there aren't lasting deficits. Wow. But da, da, da. the presenting neurological symptom is frequently visual. Right. Well, you can see that. So funny spots, funny spots in the vision, but their exam is normal. They may not have the fundus findings of hypertension. And in a child with this, their blood pressure may be 140. You know, if, if their blood pressure is normal, normally 90, 80 or 90 over a palp, as children often are, they, they can have this with what to us would appear to be a relatively normal blood pressure. Is it usually pretty symmetrical between the two eyes? Well, since it's cortical, mostly, yes. Where it is. Yeah, it's routinely spots in the vision. Chris, how's your patient? Has she improved at all? Changed? So she saw Dr. Warner uh, in clinic, um, and um, eccentrically, her vision had actually improved a bit. Um, she was able to see, I think, 2100 eccentrically. Um, her central vision hadn't gotten much better, but um, essentially, yeah, she, and she was actually good. able to do visual fields. So mm -hmm. she can count fingers in the right superior and left inferior quadrant of both eyes. And uh, yeah, she was actually able to see the eye chart, which there were tears plenty because she really had, she was functioning completely blind uh, at, at onset. So, so we've got to move on. So if you wouldn't mind, um, you can set up. Just answer this question, uh, Chris. So you said um, MRI could be normal uh, in RCVS. What, what would you see differently for a vasculitis versus the, the sausage on a string? Yeah, yeah, so um, with vasculitis, you can see similar um, similar findings. With vasculitis, you'll typically see also you know elevated inflammatory markers as well. Um, with our patient, she had an elevated ANA, which raised concern for vasculitis, but um, repeat ANA was was normal. Her, C her ESR is mildly elevated, um, but if you age adjust it, it's not really that elevated, and actually it might even be age adjusted normal. So um, yeah. You can see the usual thing with this kind is you jump to the heavy steroids, but that could make it worse. 